Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar, which is being organized as a part of Education USA's flagship application camp series 2021. Today's topic is writing a winning resume to help both undergraduate and graduate applicants to highlight a well-rounded personality aiming to showcase who they are outside of school and work in their application. And we have two experts with us uh, to take us through this topic who will also be answering all your questions too. I'm pleased to welcome Sunaina Gulati Ru, Director, Graduate Business Career Management, Levy School of Business, Santa Clara University. And Mandy Haynes, Director of International Recruitment, Muhlenberg College. A very warm welcome, Sunaina and Mandy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome, both of you. I'm your host, Ramya Ashok, advisor at Yashna Trust Education USA Bangalore. And joining me tonight is my colleague and co-advisor, Anita Bose Natarajan, who will be moderating the question and answer section. We do also have two powerhouse colleagues, Shanti Mohan and Megha Yadav, who will be helping us in the back end of the webinar. Thank you, Shanti and Mega. Now, before we get on with the session, here are some housekeeping rules. Uh, we are always very curious about our participants, so please do introduce yourself by typing into the chat box or the Q&A box your first name, are you a student or a parent or a counselor, and where you're from. We recommend you use a headphone for our session today mm -hmm. Kindly keep your microphone muted at all times and your video turned off. Questions will be answered at the end of the session. Feel free to post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat box or the Q&A box. If you are watching a recording of this webinar and have questions, do reach out to us via social media. Handouts with helpful links and information are available for downloading. Please do check the chat box at the end of the session. Now, today's webinar is a part of the Education USA India's application camp series of webinars where we aim to provide accurate, comprehensive, unbiased, and credible information about studying in the United States. If you have attended the previous sessions, we are very happy that you've joined us again. If you have missed the previous sessions, recordings can be found on our Facebook and our YouTube pages. We do have two more webinars to complete uh, this application camp series. Please do register for the upcoming sessions and attend them. All the topics discussed in this application camp series are displayed here for your information. Now, what is Education USA? Education USA is a US Department of State network of 430 plus international student advising centers worldwide. Our eight centers are conveniently located in Ahmedabad, that is eight centers in India, are conveniently located in Ahmedabad, Bengaluru, Chennai, Hyderabad, Kolkata, Mumbai, and New Delhi. And these centers are hosted by four host organizations, namely USIEF, IAES, Y-Axis, and Yashna Trust. If you are joining us from outside India, we welcome you as well. You can locate your nearest Education USA Center by looking up the educationusa.state.gov website. Education USA as a network promotes US higher education to students around the world by offering accurate, comprehensive, and current information about opportunities to study at accredited post secondary institutions in the United States. Almost all of Education USA India's events, programming, and activities are carried out virtually as of right now. We invite you to connect with us via the following ways. In India, our toll-free number is 1-800-103-1231 that is being uh, given on the screen. Uh, you can also sign up for different uh, Education USA webinars, events, and happenings. Education USA India offers daily presentations on your five steps to US study. In addition, there are information sessions on admissions and application process with US higher education representatives. 
you can Facebook chat with an Education USA advisor, and we want you to follow us on our social media channels. You can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as Education USA India. Do download uh, the Education USA India mobile app uh, from Google app or Apple app stores. For those of you looking for more personalized guidance, each Education USA India Center offers uh, individual advising memberships as well. We do encourage you to connect with us. On that note, we will jump right into the session. Over to you, Sanena. Please go ahead and share your presentation, share your screen. Thank you. Well, welcome to all of you. I really um, appreciate you being here. Um, a little bit about Santa Clara University is located in the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, we have a wonderful Bronco alumni network, um, robust career programming, and uh, of course, a stellar faculty. I encourage you all to peruse our website and you are uh, welcome to reach out to me. I will probably refer you to Santa Clara, our, our admissions folks who are much more expert in the admissions process than I am. Uh, but I um, extend a warm welcome to all of you, not only from me, but my career management team, as well as Santa Clara University's graduate business programs. So you're here to hear about resumes, uh, not listen to me. So today we're going to talk about resumes versus CVs what to avoid in a graduate school application. Um, and you will also hear from our director uh, of admissions, what to include, uh, how to reflect your experiences and what's the difference between a resume and LinkedIn. So in terms of resume versus um, your CV. So a resume is typically very concise, one page is uh, sufficient 99% of the time. It demonstrates your work experience, accomplishments, and academic history. It's used uh, for most jobs as well as grad school uh, applications. Often people confuse resumes with CVs. So what's the difference? A CV is much more detailed, usually several pages. Um, it's, it covers credential certification and mostly it's used for scientific or academic or medical job applications, which makes it very different than the purpose you need it for. Six mistakes to avoid. Adding pictures, graphics, or graphs, um, not recommended. Really making a thorough check of it for typos and errors. I know that sounds obvious, um, but it we see it all the time. And we are sensitive um, that often English is a second language for international students. So having it checked multiple times cannot hurt. Avoiding industry language or acronyms from work experience you've had. Uh, narrative paragraphs. A resume is not a conversational uh, piece. Uh, and should not be used in that way. So concise business language is recommended. Forgetting to include um, a LinkedIn URL or contact information um, is often uh, overlooked. So uh, what I recommend is that students actually use the Santa Clara uh, MS resume template, uh, which I'm happy to share with all of you. Adding references not recommended on a, on a resume. Uh, references are only provided when specifically asked for. And outdated education information or less relevant certification. So often uh, with people with uh, more experience, um, often the older or earlier work experience isn't as relevant necessary, necessarily to the, to the application. Your resume has multiple purposes. It certainly conveys your writing and communication skills. Uh, it serves as a guide for the admissions uh, process and interview. And it's an overview of your skills, experience, and educational background. 
So Susan Gutierrez is the best person to hear from because she is our assistant director of um, MS programs. So I'm gonna have you um, listen to a short video clip of Susan. Can you all hear the audio? No. Utilize master's program. And I'm here today just to give you a few tips on how to write a great resume. Uh, five easy steps. One, contact information. Add your name in larger font and make sure that you have the correct contact details, which is your email and phone number. Pretty basic. Uh, second, have a resume summary. Highlight your greatest successes as an employee, or if you're applying to a graduate program, what's your interest in this graduate program? Uh, what's your career goals um, and aspirations? And then focus on the value that you can bring either to an institution or to a company. Third, work experience. List all of your relevant jobs with the most recent at the top, and then outline your responsibilities and achievements under each job title. If you don't have any work experience, that's okay. You can list some academic achievements in that area. Fourth, your education. Include your highest degree, school name, the field of study and your graduation date. Oftentimes I'll see resumes that'll have University of Mumbai uh, 2020 and they won't list the actual major. Um, make sure that you do include that field of study. And then five, your skills. List your um, most relevant skills or skill set that you have um, and be sure to include um, anything that's relevant to the program in which you are applying um, or to the company as well. And then lastly, I do wanna mention, uh, choose your template wisely. Make sure that you don't include any photos or any special graphics. Um, make sure that it's clear, concise, um, but you don't need all those fancy bells and whistles. It actually kind of takes away from the resume itself. So I'm hoping that that will give you some really clear tips on how to write a great resume. Good luck. Hi, my name Oops, is Susan Gutierrez and I'm the... So as um, Susan um, mentioned, um, writing a concise resume is important, but how do you also weave in high impact content to the resume? So it's important to list your skills, experiences, and the, act, the accomplishment bullet statement. So how do you put those together? So for example, skill sets would be leading cross-functional teams, analytics, creativity, Combining that with experiences, forecasting, p &L budgets, product development, market research, for example, and then creating a statement or an accomplishment statement that captures all of that. So for example, created product concepts to increase volume sales in the channel, which are expected to generate at least $2 million in gross retail sales. So the important takeaway here is, uh, sorry, uh, is the metric in the accomplishment statement. Wherever you can include metrics, it always makes the accomplishment statement that much stronger. Oh, I'm sorry, I think I've got, am I in full presentation mode or have I gone out of it? You are in full screen. Okay, thank you. I, it looks smaller on mine, so I just wanted to double check, thanks. So how do you create strong impact statements? Starting with a strong lead action verb. So for example, what I would encourage you to avoid, and I see a lot of on student resumes, is a passive verb that starts the bullet. Typically the one that would most commonly use that I would encourage you not to is responsible for, which conveys passive language. So in, in, in other words, instead of saying responsible for leading a team, you would just start with led a cross-functional team to develop and launch three new products, increasing sales by 17%. So 
skill, strong action verb, what you did, and quantify the outcome wherever possible. Prove your value add by acting by adding impactful results. So really pay attention to quantifying when you can, as I mentioned, whether you increased sales, profits, margins, or value, whether you decreased costs, inefficiencies, errors, did you highlight and you know, did you identify risks? Um, what was the substance of the of the action? The scope. So instead of saying managing a team, you might say managed a team of two or four or 10, the number of people impacted. So it's always important when possible to tie what you did, even though it might've been more of an entry level um, position, which we all understand um, students come out of school, typically they go into entry level positions for the first couple of years. But how did those, how did that scope of your work define the larger business? And to qualify, whether you present it to senior management, for example, or to clients, um, did you deliver on time, early, under budget? So wherever you can qualify um, to, to demonstrate how you added value to the business, it's always preferred. And I've listed some examples. So I assume you will, be able to see this recording and have access to the slide deck. So I won't go into all the, the details of it. So as I mentioned, we have a graduate business school uh, template, which helps to actually get to that goal of being concise and uh, impactful. Most graduate business schools do have a resume template for their graduate business students that is required when they're applying for job for jobs in, in, the, in the US. As you probably already know and have gathered, uh, US business um, culture values brevity in resumes and in general values brevity in all business communications, such as emails, cover letters, anything um, that you are expected uh, to write in a business setting, but the shorter, the communication, the better. So the template often is uh, one page. Uh, rarely, um, if at all, will you see a two-page resume template for graduate business students. Even for our executive MBAs who have 17 to 20 years of experience or more, we're still encouraging them to keep it brief and minimize their early work experience and focus on more relevant and current work experience. So the built-in guidance allows some personalization. Susan mentioned adding um, a summary. So on this template, you won't see a summary because this is the template we use for current students for job applications. I think for graduate school admissions, if you wanna add a short summary and overview of your background and experience, I think that's perfectly fine. So what's the difference between LinkedIn and your resume? So a, your resume is usually uh, targeted for a specific purpose. In your case, it would be graduate school admissions or later on when you're, when you're done with your graduate degree, a job. So resume should be tailored for each job and purpose. LinkedIn really should be more of a focus on your brand and industry because you can't change LinkedIn up for every, every time you want to apply. So level of detail. Resumes are much more to the point, as I mentioned. LinkedIn, you can add a bit more detail. It's a bit more dynamic. You can add attachments, for example, of work or a presentation or a short video clip. So it's in real time. What I will point out is please don't attach your resume to LinkedIn. The reason being you will customize your resume eventually for jobs. And if there's a disconnect between the resume on, that's posted on LinkedIn and a job application resume that could get you into kind of a sticky situation which we wanna avoid. Tone of voice. A resume is much more formal. LinkedIn has a summary section which can be 
used in a little bit more of a personal voice. And by that, I mean, using the I personalized pronoun. I am, you know, uh, a master of supply chain or logistics or whatever the case may be. And LinkedIn, of course, can include imagery and media and a headshot, which we discourage from including on a resume. So believe it or not, I am at the end in the spirit of brevity of your resume. Uh, that concludes my portion. And uh, I think I'm turning it over back to you. And uh, Mandy will talk about undergrad, right? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, give me just a moment, everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. All right, can everyone see that okay? Good. Mandy. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Mandy Haynes, and I'm the Director of International Recruitment at Muhlenberg College. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank the Education USA team for inviting me here today to present to you all. It's really a pleasure to get to do this. Um, one quick overview of Muhlenberg. Uh, we're a small liberal arts college and we are located in the state of Pennsylvania, which is in the Northeast region of the US. Uh, we're in the third largest city in Pennsylvania and we're about 90 minutes from New York City, just to give you a little context. Um, Muhlenberg is known for having a very flexible academic program and some of our signature majors are theater. We have a nationally ranked theater and dance program, uh, a strong business program, as well as uh, great programs in the health sciences, but overall 39 majors. Um, so just want to give you a very quick snapshot of Muhlenberg College before we begin. So now let's talk about writing a, a winning resume um, as a prospective undergraduate student. So you're currently in high school, you're preparing your undergraduate college applications. When and why should you consider writing a resume? Uh, well, you've probably done a lot over your high school career. You've been involved in a lot of different activities. Perhaps you've won different awards or honors. And so creating a resume uh, really is a good snapshot of all of your accomplishments. Um, and it's important as you are starting to put together your college application for you to sit down and, and really kind of take inventory of what you've done in high school and how you want to showcase yourself in your college application. Um, so creating a resume early on as you are pulling all of these application pieces together um, serves several purposes. Um, in addition to creating that important snapshot, it can help you prepare for college admissions interviews um, during which uh, you will be asked questions about some of your high school experiences. So it helps you kind of pull all of that information together. And a resume can be very helpful for your teachers, uh, your college counselor or your headmaster, whomever is writing a letter of recommendation on your behalf. Uh, having that resume um, to share with, with your recommenders really gives them a, a, a full sense of what you've been involved in, um, not just in your school, but perhaps in your community as well. So that can be a very important um, reminder for your recommenders of some of your accomplishments. And it will also help you prepare for your application. Um, maybe you're completing the common application and there will be an activity section on your application file. So doing this early resume gets you organized to actually complete the application file. Um, but then you want to decide whether completing the activities on the application itself is enough or 
should you create a separate resume to submit with your application materials? Um, that's a great question. And I'm gonna give you an answer that unfortunately we often give in college admissions. It depends. <laughs> I know um, sometimes students get frustrated by that because there are so many um, extenuating, extenuating circumstances, but it does truly depend. Let me give you some things to consider um, that might be helpful as you're, as you're thinking about whether to submit a separate resume. It is most important to submit a separate resume if it adds something to your application file. Um, are there uh, are there, is there information that you can submit in your resume that we're not going to learn about you in the other parts of your application file? Um, that is particularly helpful for us. Um, if you are able to really highlight specific accomplishments that you cannot showcase in, in the rest of your application. Um, sometimes students are applying for very specific programs, um, perhaps uh, you know, a music conservatory program where highlighting your performances can be particularly important. Um, sometimes students have been involved in competitive athletics and having a resume that really highlights their athletic accomplishments can be very important. Um, but the, I, I believe the most important aspect of it is, is it adding something to the activities you've already listed on your application file? Um, and will the colleges and universities you're applying to accept a separate resume um, as a supplemental uh, application material? So if you can answer yes to those questions, then absolutely take the time to fully prepare a separate resume. If it's not adding to your application, if the schools you're applying to don't welcome additional materials, then I would say your time is best spent really putting together the strongest application, focusing on your essay, um, and don't spend your time preparing a separate resume. Um, so in general, throughout your entire application, um, I'm talking about the application form itself, all of the supporting materials, you want to focus on the aspects of your application file that set you apart from other applicants. Uh, most of the students who apply to our institutions are academically qualified. Um, so many of us are looking for other qualities um, to really kind of set students apart and start to get an idea of which students um, will be good community members at our institutions. And that can be based on your academic credentials, your academic goals, but also your personal qualities and, and your extracurricular accomplishments. Um, this becomes particularly important at small liberal arts colleges like Muhlenberg um, that have a holistic admissions review process. So we are absolutely looking closely at your academic credentials, at your transcript, to make sure that you are ready for rigorous college academics, but we're also uh, paying attention to your activities and getting a sense of who you are as an individual and how you might engage our community in different ways. Um, so a resume is a great place for you to be able to kind of tell us about those qualities that, that set you apart from other candidates. Um, so what is important to include in your application, uh, in your resume rather? Definitely uh, clear and concise contact information in your header. Uh, some of this seems obvious, but we see these um, issues frequently, that's why we mention them. Make sure that the name on your resume matches the name that you have indicated on your application. Um, 
when you are using an email address for your application and your resume, give some thought to that email address. Uh, make sure that it is um, professional and appropriate. Um, you don't want to necessarily use a provocative or quirky email address uh, in your college application um, and on your resume. Um, you wanna take uh, some space to highlight your educational information, um, list your high school name, the city, state, country your high school is located in. Uh, give us a sense of your academic achievements, so your GPA. Um, if you've taken standardized tests, you can share those scores. And then the rest of your resume is really dedicated to your academic honors, your other awards, the clubs and organizations you've been involved in, both within your school and in your community. Um, and it's not just limited to um, you know, clubs that you've been a part of, but also think about the ways that you regularly commit yourself and spend your time and the things that you most care about. Um, those can be self-directed ac activities. They can be religious and spiritual commitments. Um, perhaps you are um, deeply involved in community service. Uh, you have a, a seasonal or part-time job that you're working during school. Um, Many students have um, significant family responsibilities. Um, so when you are putting together your resume, you don't need to give us your whole life story for sure. You don't need to list every club or every commitment you've done over the four years of high school. Um, we're, we're looking for quality over quantity. So if you spent one semester of your uh, grade nine in the French club, maybe not that important to include on your resume. You want to think about uh, commitments that you have sustained over several years and that are really important for you. Um, and sometimes I think students uh, will list, you know, 20 different activities. And what happens is it ends up diluting your whole resume because it, be, it, it becomes difficult for us to decipher which of these activities are really meaningful to you, which have you really been dedicated to and maybe taken leadership roles in. Um, so that's why it's important at the onset to sit down and give some thought to what you want to include in your, in your resume. And then at the bottom, uh, once you've listed everything, if you have special skills that you want to include, absolutely. Maybe you're fluent in multiple languages, um, you are a musician, uh, you're, uh, you enjoy you know, at, um, leisure sports or art or reading or baking. Um, if there are skills that you regularly devote time to, it's absolutely appropriate to include those on, on this type of resume. And your accomplishments are best remembered um, and best highlighted if you cite specific examples. Um, so show us, don't just tell us in your resume. Um, so you can do this by giving some very concise um, context for some of your accomplishments. And I'll give you a, a few examples of what I mean by that. Um, perhaps you uh, received a special recognition in your high school, but you were one of 20 students selected for that recognition. Well, that absolutely elevates it. Um, you know, when I read that, uh, one of 20 students selected. Uh, if you have been involved in community service, let us know, like perhaps you've completed 300 community service hours or you received recognition for um, you know, having the highest number of community service hours in your school community. Um, if you have been involved in fundraisers at your school, um, did you have a particular fundraiser where you exceeded your goal? And if so, by how much? So giving this kind of context really gives us a stronger sense of what you've been involved in and makes your resume feel more personal. 
as a reader, I feel like I've really gotten an opportunity to understand <clears throat> more about the student when I get some really specific examples of their involvement. And it also helps me see how they might participate in those kinds of activities in my college community. Um, and ultimately that's what we're looking for is students who are going to come here and add to the richness of our communities by getting involved in different ways um, and participating not just in the classroom, but also um, you know, in a very well-rounded sense. So think about ways that you want to really highlight your, your accomplishments. Another great way to do that is by using action words to distinguish your abilities. Um, so when you are writing your resume, think about what those words are that help you showcase yourself, that let us see, again, how you're going to engage our community, um, make it a strong, strong, strongly worded resume with really impactful action words. So here are some tips for creating your resume. Um, because this is a document that you are submitting with your college application, it's highlighting your high school experience. So on your resume, you want to just focus on your four years of high school. Um, we, great that you were involved in, in middle school or elementary school, but we're not going to really look that far back. So focus on your past four years, and you want to list your accomplishments um, as much as you can in chronological order, but start with your most recent activities first. That gives us a sense of what you're involved in now. Um, and as you're doing that, make sure that you use consistent verb tense and language. Um, so if you're currently leading your team, you want to let us know leading team. If you led your team last year, make sure you're using the proper um, tense there. Uh, if your activity has an acronym, let us know what it stands for. Um, and you will be surprised how many resumes and applications I read where students list acronyms for their activities. And I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> what they stand for. Um, so help us out a little bit and just let us know um, the full name of the uh, club or organization that you're involved in. You want to use a clean format, so a clean template for your resume that's easy to read and follow. Uh, there are great resources for you online um, in Google, in uh, through um, Word documents. Um, and you know you can find some really great templates available online. So I would encourage you to spend some time um, looking through different templates and, and kind of deciding what feels best for you. But having a clean and easy to read uh, template is important. Um, and you know, be mindful of the font size and style. We are reading a lot of applications. <laughs> um, and so our eyes get very tired. And when I come across a document that has very small font, I'm less likely to spend a lot of time on it um, than I am something that that's really uh, friendly to my eyes. So um, you know, give that thought as well. And then you want to stay with the most important experiences that showcase you. So as I recommended before, don't dilute your resume by including experiences that you've only been briefly involved in that, that really don't highlight um, your, your commitments. Uh, proofread. And this does not just go for your resume. This is important for every part of your application file. Make sure you proofread, have someone else proofread for you. You want to edit your draft before you finalize your resume. And then once you have finalized and you're ready to go, uh, save it as a PDF so that you've got a very clean copy that you can share. Um, 
when it comes to submitting your, your resume, um, you want to check with the colleges and universities you're applying to. There are a number of ways that you can actually submit your resume. Um, perhaps you can upload it through the application um, form itself. Uh, many of us have online student portals, and you can upload additional materials like a resume to the portal. Um, if you are doing an admissions interview, you can share uh, that document with your interviewer. Um, you can also send a PDF to the admissions counselor who represents your territory. Um, so for international students applying to Muhlenberg, they're welcome to submit um, additional application materials directly to me, and I make sure that those get um, added to their application file. And you can always uh, send uh, an email to the general admissions uh, email account and send a copy of your resume as well. So if you are unsure, I would recommend reaching out to the schools to, to get some advice on that, but know that there are multiple ways for you to do that. Um, what should you avoid when preparing your resume? First, you don't need to tell us your whole life story, so keep it concise. Um, make sure that you are uh, being thoughtful to your reader, so in your, in your formatting. Um, you don't need to write long descriptions of your activities. Um, use bullet points and, and highlight powerful sentences or phrases that really give us a sense of what your involvement is. Um, don't rush this resume exercise. Take your time, um, just as you do with all of the other important parts of your application file. Um, you're not going to sit down and write your personal essay in 15 minutes. So you don't think that you'll be able to do your resume very quickly as well. Take your time to do it well and, and thoughtfully. Um, and then finally, um, don't try to make this particular high school resume um, into a business resume. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have uh, an objective or a statement of purpose for this type of resume. Uh, you don't need to try to include, you know, business related skill sets um, or use, you know, that kind of business language in this resume. You want to keep it appropriate for the situation. Um, again, you're a high school student applying for an undergraduate institution. Um, and this uh, information is really considered supplemental to your academic credentials and your application form. So keep it appropriate for the situation. Um, and more than likely, it is going to be a great way to, to really highlight yourself as a strong candidate for the institution. Um, finally, I would say that if uh, you know you've considered all of these options and you realized that perhaps you don't need to write a separate resume, uh, there are other ways that you can showcase your your talents and and your interests uh, in your application file. Um, you can submit an arts portfolio you can oftentimes submit a supplemental um, personal statement or essay. Um, some schools uh, offer auditions for performing arts. Um, you can do an admissions interview. Uh, you can provide um, links to a blog or video footage um, that, that supplement um, your other application materials. So a resume is certainly a powerful way to incorporate all of those but um, not the only way that you can, you can really highlight what you've been involved in in high school. Um, so with that, uh, I know that we are going to have a, a Q&A session now. Um, I've got my email here. So if anyone wants to take a quick snapshot of my email, uh, you're welcome to do that. And thank you so much. I look forward to hearing some of your great questions now. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I see hands raised. Please type your questions in and we will address them 
in a few minutes. Um, and as you are typing in your questions, I'd like to remind everybody the next in, um, you know, web webinars in this series. Uh, please do join us. We have pre we have the previous sessions recorded, and it's on our YouTube channel, Education USA India. Would help if I went to. Okay, there we go. Um, all right. So do take a screenshot. These are all the Education USA India centers. You're welcome to contact the center nearest you. If you're joining us from outside India, do check out the URL at the bottom right, educationusa.state.gov for Education USA centers in your country. I'm going to stop sharing right now and we will be taking questions. All right, so I will go in order of kind of like how we <clears throat> receive the questions. So the first question is, um, and it goes for both undergrad and grad. So Mandy and Sudena, do all colleges universities ask for a resume? Is it mandatory? Mandy, I'll let you go first for on the undergraduate side. Sure. Um, it is not mandatory um, for undergraduate admissions. So it's important to know the schools you're applying to and whether they require or encourage a resume. Um, for schools like Muhlenberg, uh, smaller colleges, um, we will accept it as a supplemental material, so it's not required. Um, but if you're applying to a large university where they're getting tens of thousands of applications every year, they might discourage a resume because they don't, they simply don't have the time um, to process supplemental materials. So make sure you know whether it will be accepted before you go through uh, the time and effort of, of creating it. I would say by and large, it is required for graduate business school applications um, for all of our programs, Santa Clara, you know, the grad business programs, you know, we have the MBA program and all of our MS programs, which you can learn more about on our website. I have put a link in for admissions events, but I'd say overall, yes, for graduate business school, definitely. Thank you. Next question, again, both grad and undergrad, where can we find credible resume samples to follow? Basically the templates. So I've included the template in the chat as well. Um, so the only difference is that Susan um, in her video, admissions video mentioned including an overview summary. So if you wanna use the Santa Clara grad business template for other school applications, I that's fine. I have no issue with that. You might want to add a short overview or summary. What I would recommend to all of you is please don't add an objective. The objective is not to gain uh, admission in a graduate business program. So skip the objective because it's inherently implicit when you're applying to graduate school, that is your objective. So it's redundant. So just do a short, summary of who you are as an applicant. Andy, samples. I think you can find great sample templates just by Googling uh, resume templates online. Uh, there are so many different formats and, and even categories for resumes. So um, spend some time doing a little bit of research on that so that you um, can, can really kind of um, home in on the kind of resume you want to create, what you want your, your template to look like. But you will find even by Googling more, more templates than, than you have time to look through. And I'd like to add that, you know, some of those templates, like Mullenberg perhaps has samples on their website. I know Purdue has, Carnegie Mellon has, Santa Clara U has. So when you do Google and you come to a link that's tied to an institution, pay close attention because, you know, that's already verified by the institution that that's what they recommend students use. So, you know, something like that also um, as a guide for students. Right, and so, may, maybe yeah. if I could just add one more thing on that, 
For students who have a, a college counselor um, at their high school or are working with an independent counselor um, or even you know, the Education USA office, oftentimes um, that, that person will have some great resources for resume templates as well. So um, utilize those resources if you have them. Thank you. All right, for Sunena, for doctoral program applications, should the resume be any different or would you suggest the same approach of brevity? Uh, it's for doctoral. So I don't know, you know, resume or CV in this case. So I think um, I'm not as familiar with uh, doctoral applications, but I would um, feel pretty confident in saying uh, to have a brief resume, but to also include a list of publications or research papers that you've done would be required. Um, and I'm sure, again, like Mandy said, if you Google that, you'll probably get more information on doctoral program applications. Yes, and usually for doctoral program applications, they will tell you if they're looking for CV, a resume, and then like a research statement. So you, you actually have to look down to the department. The next question is uh, from Facebook. I'm looking at research degrees like PhD and was wondering how should we document research internships slash assistantships on our resume? So it could even be like a student, you know, applying for an MS slash PhD where they've had internships and assistantships. So how should they word that? Um, that be for Sanena. Um. I'm sorry, I was, um, so I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I was responding to someone in chat. Okay, no problem. Okay, so the student is asking, I'm planning to apply for a research, um, not position, but a, uh, a research, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, studying uh, thing, so a PhD. So should it be, uh, how do I position my internship and research experience because I'm applying for a PhD? In the so US. Sim similarly, as you would any work experience, you know, your title, what you did in, in, did in that role, there's not that much uh, difference in terms of positioning it uh, differently. Um, I think uh, the ground rules still apply. It's essentially work experience for you. Yeah, all right. It's counted as an experience. Um, next question for Mandy. I've heard that when anyone submits a resume, you come off as the, the student comes off as too proud is that as there's already a place to mention your activities. Um, so is that how it's taken? <laughs> and how I, many pages should my should I limit my resume? That's <laughs> well, perhaps it would seem too proud if your resume is five pages long. So I would recommend a one page resume. Uh, and I, you know, the college admissions process is one that requires you to brag a little bit about yourself. Um, you need to really showcase uh, what, what makes you a special applicant for an institution. Um, as I mentioned before, it's a lot of this is about setting yourself apart from other applicants who are just as academically qualified as you. So it is okay to brag a little bit and, and showcase yourself. Um, what you want to keep in mind is um, if that resume is only copying the activities on your application, then you're not really adding any additional information. So think about what can you add that will give us more, tell us more about who you are. Um, but please um, make sure that you give us everything that we should know about you so we get a full sense of, of who you are um, and, and how you might be a great member of the community here. So it's okay to list your activities, but you need to elaborate beyond the 150 character common app restriction. Okay. <laughs> because that was one of the questions. The next one I think you guys would enjoy, it's both for grad and undergrad. Many tell me not to include listening to K-pop music and enjoying Korean culture as it's, be as it's being Indian. Uh, as it's not being Indian, uh, as a hobby on my resume, since the admissions offices might have a bad impression of me. Is that true? 
They, <laughs> they want permission here. <laughs> well, I know in Santa Clara, we're in California, so we're pretty open-minded. Um, I would not maybe list it as a hobby, but I would put it as an additional information just to add a little color or nuance. Your per it conveys your personality and that's absolutely fine. Um, I wouldn't go on and on about it, but I, like I said, we value brevity, uh, but certainly I think um, our admissions people, if they saw that that was a hobby or an interest in additional information, I don't think it would be a problem at all. <laughs> I completely agree. <laughs> right, Mandy? Yeah. I mean, I don't listen to K-pop, but it might inspire me to. I don't know. <laughs> So, so Dana, for the grad application, it's okay because we do have students. I mean, you know, they, they have their hobbies, listening to music, reading. Um, some are very accomplished dancers, but it's got nothing to do with their MS, MBA degree. Oh, I think it's perfectly fine. And I do see on uh, resumes, you know, um, Indian classical dancing, music, yeah. painting, um, you know, um, cooking, it just adds a little bit of another dimension. And sometimes it can be a conversation starter. So obviously all of you are, are responsible, smart, uh, you know, uh, human beings. You're not gonna put anything that's off color uh, in, in the additional information. And that's the only thing, you know, um, I think just good common sense. Um, that if it's, um, and I, I think uh, equally as important as good common sense and sharing hobbies is what Mandy said. And I wanna repeat that because it was an important point that you have a professional email. So I see silly things, uh, you know, um, I don't know, pink girl with, you know, ballerina, you know, at Gmail. I mean, just ridiculous things. So keep in mind that this is a good starting point before you apply for undergrad or college um, that you have a professional Gmail because you will use it through probably your entire, the, you know, entire uh, journey moving forward. Then you don't have to change it. So just something simple and have it at Gmail, your name, and, you know, that's it. Very clean. And then you can hold on to it. Ram, you had something to add? I see the video go on. Minecraft, no? She has kids who want to put on Minecraft. So that's another question also is, is it okay? Because they're very excited about Minecraft. Yes, so I would, I would keep it generic. I might not mention specific games. I would just say, you know, um, you know, avid video game player or expert video game player. Um, because I think certain games, uh, I know just from my own adult boys that some of them are a little bit more violent and you know, raises my eyebrows, but they say, oh, mom, everyone's you know, playing whatever Grand Theft Auto. I mean, I never liked that one, but everyone, you know, they were playing it. So I'm just saying that I wouldn't go into names. Okay, great. That's a very good suggestion. Just a general uh, description. Um, next question for Mandy. My government has honored me as an early change maker for organizing an event. Should I include it in my awards section? Absolutely. That sounds like a wonderful uh, accomplishment to highlight. So yes, that is exactly the kind of information we, we want to learn about. Okay. Next and, and maybe, you know, I'm sorry, if there's just a little context to that, just, um, you know, describe not only uh, the, the honor, but the um, you know, why were you uh, chosen for that honor? Or what does it mean? Are, are there certain requirements for you? Um, so give us a little bit of context for it. Yeah, sometimes students don't realize they were chose, chosen out of thousands of students. They don't realize that, you know, that's what they need to portray as well. So we know how tough it was to get exactly. that particular award. Yeah. Uh, again, for Mandy, and this is a, I think a lot of students and parents have this question. Can we include eighth grade activities as there were no in-person school activities that happened for the last two years? I did see that in the chat. And that yeah. is a very good question. Um, 
here's what I would say, given um, the circumstances that we've all found ourselves in in the last few years where um, activities and, and social opportunities have been postponed, if you were involved in something in eighth grade that remains very important to you um, or has shaped who you are now in some way, absolutely. So that's where, uh, you know, during that exercise of sitting down and, and sort of outlining what you want to include on your resume becomes more important. Um, and, and I know I said, you know, stick with what you've done in high school, and that is the most important. But during the circumstances we're in now, I think it's absolutely appropriate. Um, the other uh, point that I will make is um, for students who are filling out the common application, um, Common App does have a question um, that relates to the pandemic um, and gives students an opportunity to explain how they've been affected by COVID-19, whether that's, you know, personally, academically, extracurriculars have been canceled. Um, if there's information that you want to share, um, you do have space on the application to do that as well. Okay, this ties in. There's another question since we're on this topic. Students asking, I've been doing an activity from before high school. Do I mention only the achievements achieved during high school? I think you've answered that already. Yeah, and perhaps in one of your bullet points, you can say, um, uh, you know, involved for 10 years or committed to this organization for six years or, you know, just kind of give an indication of, of your time, time commitment. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, this is a little off topic, but allow it because we have time. Uh, for Mandy, does Mullenberg meet 100% demonstrated interest for international students? Is there any special scholarship at Mullenberg which can cover the whole cost of attendance? Uh, great question. Uh, Muhlenberg does offer um, scholarships to international students. Um, we, we don't cover the full cost of attendance. We typically can cover um, up to half the cost of attendance with scholarships. Um, I will point out that we are um, a partner institution with the Next Genius Foundation in India. Um, and so through that program, we do offer a full tuition award. Um, and then we are um, announcing next week two new scholarships specifically for international students. Um, so if you are um, interested in those, please feel free to reach out to me directly so I can make sure you're on our email distribution list because we'll be sending an email next week. But typically um, we can cover half the cost of attendance. I'm glad I asked you that question about Muhlenberg then, because this is important. New scholarships coming out, very important for students. All right, a uh, question for both grad and undergrad. If my resume exceeds one page, very popular question. Will it sound informal? Can I do it? Can I use Grammarly for language proofreading? So I answered this before um, in, in chat. Grammarly will sometimes miss certain things. Um, for example, there might be a context, you know, um, that it, that it misses. I'm trying. So a good example is there and there. T-H-E-I-R is the possessive. T-H-E-R-E -E is, um, you know, a, a location or a specific spot. Grammarly might miss that in, in certain contexts. So I would not rely on it a hundred percent. Um, certainly use Word, you know, use spell check. The best thing I recommend to students is you read your resume out loud to yourself or have someone read it out loud to you and have multiple eyes on it. Um, and um, I think that's the best way uh, to do that. A two page resume, I really don't recommend it. Uh, I'm pretty firm on this. You will find lots of different opinions about this. Mine is just one data point but I am a stickler uh, for one page resumes because even uh, I'm imagining most of you are of a certain age demographic and um, 
I could only imagine reading a two page resume for someone with 25 to 30 years of work experience. Uh, if you are, um, you know, uh, if you have that, well, by all means, have a two page resume. But unless you're in that category, there's no reason for a two page resume. It just means you're not editing and you're not being concise. Andy, one page, two page. One page. And I completely agree with Sunaina on the reading aloud exercise. Uh, so your resume and your, your personal statement, take the time to read it aloud. You will not only catch errors, uh, but you'll also get a sense of the cadence and the flow of your writing. And it can be a very helpful exercise. Yeah, that, that's a new one. I hadn't heard about reading aloud, but I like that a lot. Um, so this, an, a student wants to double check, it's not recommended, Sonena, to write the objective in the resume. Double check yes. here. Um, do not, your, your resume never actually needs an objective. So even in the job market, um, for students who are completing their graduate programs with us, um, uh, you know, with degrees in MS, information systems, analytics, whatever it is, and they're applying for a particular job, there's no need to state an objective. Your objective is clear by the application process itself. Okay, next question is for Mandy. Does mention of community hours actually have any weightage? Uh, well, there's not a metric. So we're not, you know, plugging those community hours into a formula um, to determine whether you're admissible to the college. But what it does is shows your commitment. Um, and that that's the whole point of um, showcasing your your activities and and um, and your experiences. So it gives us a, a, a sense of what you care about uh, and why. Uh, and again, how you might then contribute to our community uh, as, a, as a college community member. So um, the hours really are, are meant to show that you've been deeply committed to something. Okay, I think part of the confusion is we have a lot of kids here in India where they will have friends and relatives in the US. And in the US, um, the kids over there in high school will tell them, I've heard this very commonly, that they're required to do community hours. Otherwise, uh, it looks bad on their application. So the kids over here, international kids, are wondering you know, if that will affect them as well because not all schools require community hours. So that's the confusion. Do they really have to do it or it's okay because they're coming in? internationally. Understood, understood. Um, you don't really have to do it. Uh, you should choose activities that interest you, that speak to, um, you know, what you want to pursue. And, and so that, that's how you should choose activities in high school. Um, please don't choose activities that you think we want you to have or you think will look more impressive on your resume. Um, do what is authentically you. Um, and you know that's important, not just with your activities, but in everything you do. You want to, to be authentic and, um, and to commit your time to activities that are meaningful. So if you haven't been involved in community service, that is okay. Uh, highlight the experiences that you have been involved in and help us understand why those are important to you. And, and I just want to reiterate, yeah. I just want to chime in here for students and parents, uh, and we come across this a lot, is really um, take in what Mandy said, to be authentic, honest. Do not feel a compulsion to... Um, Fabricate, lie, exaggerate. Um, it's not going to serve you well. It the it, you know admissions officers are really savvy, as are recruiters in the job market. They can pick up when you're um, not really coming from an authentic uh, a place of integrity. So 
Uh, I know students are often pressured by family member and family members and parents uh, to kind of, you know, add to their resume in ways that is just simply not appropriate. Um, so please know, uh, honesty is valued. Okay, on along the same lines, uh, because it's very normal in India for uh, kids, students to help out neighbors, elderly relatives, does that fall under community service? Because they, they help out with grocery shopping, picking up meds and stuff like that. Does that fall under community service for them? Well, I, I just, you know, I think and that, that I think that's a really good example of, um, you know, kind of veering on that gray line. I think you're just being a, a, a good human being and yeah. a good family member. Uh, you get volunteered your, by your parents. Too. Yes. And I understand Indian culture. I'm from Indian culture. Families are vast. They're, you know, families never end in India. They just go in the, the it's just everyone's in your family. So I could see how it would be viewed as a job. Theoretically, you know, you're helping 10 people on a regular basis, week in and week out. Um, however, um, I think um, to be mindful that if you were to compare and contrast your American counterparts, the, the community service, for example, that high school students are doing are for outside organizations. So if we do apples to apples. With that said, Mandy said, it's not a requirement. It's not going to disadvantage you. Um, but if you are so inclined, I would take your volunteer time to yes. an organization and then include that in your resume and let your family know. And I know Indian families, they're all competitive. They want you to get into those American schools. Say, guess what? Don't have time for the 10 aunties for the next six months or a year. I have to do this. If you want me to include this in my application. Uh, I don't have time for the aunties uh, till, you know, the following year. <laughs> All right. Right. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, okay. So the next question before I get sidetracked, how do I show that any of my activities is important to me? Um, as you may not know, as you may not be aware that the organization I'm linked to or any personal project that I'm working on? How do I showcase something that is important to me, but that's not very well known? Uh, again, undergrad and grad. Uh, well, certainly um, utilize some of the tips that we've given in the presentation today. Uh, highlight it by showing consistent commitment um, by using strong action words to describe your involvement, um, to show, in addition to tell, uh, how that has been meaningful to you. Um, so, and there's not one answer to that question. It's, it will be unique to every activity and every individual. Um, so this becomes part of your uh, planning stage when you're putting that resume together is sitting down and answering that question for yourself. How am I going to, sh to show and tell that this has been important to me? Thank you. Okay, the next question I don't quite understand. So I would like the person who typed it to clarify. The question is, is it always better for undergrad applicants to merge corporate experience with academic achievements? So if you wrote that question, can you please rewrite it and give me an example of what you mean? Because I'm not sure how to interpret. Um, so Nana, this is for you. What do you mean by professional email and email with a personal domain or regular Gmail? I did answer that in the chat and I meant okay. a regular, a regular yeah. email versus yeah. a personal uh, domain. Yes. Okay. So this question is almost all of my extracurricular activities are in the social field. I work to uplift my community. I work for arts and culture, but I want to study STEM and engineering. Do my activities have to align with my major? This has to be for undergrad. So it will be Mandy. Do my no. activities? Yeah. They, your activities do not have to align. Um, you know, if you are interested in STEM fields, then that's wonderful. Um, and you've been committed to the arts. What a well-rounded person you are. Um, you know, we, we might look for some consistency to uh, indicate your interest in STEM, but we're going to look at your academics. 
uh, what what types of classes and, and um, academic stream you followed in school. Uh, we're gonna look to your letters of recommendation to hear from teachers and your counselor about your academic involvement. Um, so, you know, sometimes activities do align with your academic interest, but other times they really indicate that you're an incredibly uh, well-rounded person with diverse interests and, and either is great. Okay, thank Both you. Both are great, I should say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd like to see, you know, that you have more interest than just academic something else, a little bit more about you. Um, okay, so this again to Mandy, because it says activity, I've worked as an executive of an organization that's raised uh, $22,000 for COVID-19 emergency, and we helped a lot of people. Is it considered an activity, and how do I calculate my hours involved? Uh, in that situation, you, you don't have to calculate your hours. And, and I think I've created some confusion with that, with that example. Um, you don't need to give the total number of hours committed to each activity. Um, my example of, you know, community service hours was just really to, to um, illustrate when you can give us specific examples that elevate your experience or really put it into context of what you've accomplished, that's helpful. But you don't need to give hours committed to each activity. And certainly with that particular accomplishment, um, it sounds like there are a number of ways that you can really highlight that in your application. Um, certainly, um, you know, on your activities list, in your resume, that might even be something that you want to write about in your personal statement. Um, it sounds like a really meaningful uh, way to, to give your time. I think they're trying to figure out because in the common app, it asks, you know, how, how frequently were you engaged in this activity once a week, twice a week, how many weeks? So I would say maybe average it out. That's what I tell a lot of students. Like if you're yeah. mentioning a bunch, just average it out because uh, yeah. admission's not going to hold you to it. But, you know, don't say you spent the whole year when you didn't, as what Sunena said, don't like. All right. So again, Mandy, as I understand, only if the university is requesting a resume as part of the common app, do we need to submit the resume? Only if it's insisting or if it's an option. Uh, it's not usually required. So if it is an option and you have all of the other conditions that I talked about, then absolutely you can submit it. Um, some institutions will say, please do not submit. We cannot accommodate resumes and supplemental materials. So you, you definitely don't want to submit it if the institution asks you not to. Um, but if it's encouraged or um, accepted, sure. Yeah, and I just want to reinforce what Mandy said. So if the institution doesn't require it and you submit it, it demonstrates a lack of the ability to follow directions. And that is an important um, skill to convey in your application process. That not only can you follow, you, you're paying attention to details and you're following directions. Yeah, so again, if it's optional and you want to, you can send it. But if they say, we are not requiring a resume, we're not gonna look at it, please don't submit it because they have a question is for Lena, does it look good if I mention my community service in a grant? So this already, one more time, please. Wait, I'm sorry, you broke up there. I didn't. Oh, sorry. No. Okay, so the question is, does it look good if I mention my community service in grad applications? Absolutely, absolutely. It shows that you are, you know, a well-rounded person and you're giving back. Um, yeah, absolutely. But it should not be your whole resume. <laughs> Especially for grad school, you should be tailoring it towards what you want to study. That's the key thing. Yeah, and I, and I think um, one of the important things to take away is that often we see long resumes and a lot of writing from international students. It's just a different culture. You're entering a different culture. 
And American culture has significant differences, especially with respect to, you know, whether it's an undergraduate school application or graduate school application. And all I can say um, is please just believe brevity is valued in this culture. Um, and especially in business, because people get hundreds of emails, they're reading a lot of content on social media, they're posting, the demand for uh, just an individual's ability to read and process information is, I would say, universally over the top. We're all overwhelmed. So the more concise you can be, um, it's kind of, a, a it's just uh, really demonstrating that you get it, right? And that um, the resume is simply an overview. It is not the end all. It's simply the start of a conversation. Um, and that's all it should be. It's an appetizer. It's not the main course. Okay, so the next question is both from Andy and Sunaina. Since we do not have GPA and have our marks calculated out of 100, how do the universities evaluate? And the next related question is an average of 85% equivalent to like 4.0 on a GPA scale that's unweighted. Oh, those are difficult questions to answer because each institution will have a different way of evaluating your academic credentials. Uh, so some schools will recalculate your academics into a, a 4.0 GPA. Others do not. Um, it, it, there's really no uh, universal answer to that question. It, it depends on the institution. And I'm, I'm not going to, um, you know, uh, I'm not going to have a lot of um, input into that because I'm not on the admission side. And so I'm going to defer to Mandy. I'm sure every institution does look at it differently. But I would say I think every institution knows the differences in terms of country and scoring. You know, they figured it out. Uh, and so I think it, it will translate um, appropriately. Yeah, I agree because we have spoken to numerous admissions people and that's what they say, we have our own way. We either recommend a service that does it for us for undergrad and grad, or just give us your transcripts and we know how to translate it. Um, there's and, another- it, And it's not just about the scores. Yes. It's about yes. everything yes. else on your application. Yes. It's a holistic view. Admissions people are really savvy in looking beyond um, test scores. That's what the interview is all about, looking at what activities you've done. Um, so don't, um, and I think that's also a big cultural difference. There's such an emphasis on scores and metrics, not only in the US, but globally. Yeah. But I do think the US sets a good example of looking at the whole person. And it's not just about the scores. True. Uh, along the same lines, but I'll answer it. The student has asked to have a GPA of 3.81 out of 4.0 unweighted. A college or a college that the student is looking at says they require 3.9. This is interesting. And student wants to know if they fall in that category compared to the US system of rating. So I will answer that as whichever college or institution is asking for 3.9 kindly email them and ask them because they will be able to evaluate and tell you whether you are, you know, a valid applicant or not before you actually apply. Um, they're usually more than happy to tell you up front. They're not, you know, waiting for you to apply, take your admission money and say no. So, you know, an email never hurts. Okay. Somebody wanted to know, Sunena, how will you know if I'm lying about an activity of my resume. How do you guys tell? That's what, that's a very common question. You know, parents, students will go, but it's plausible, that activity is plausible. How will they know I'm lying? Well, no comment, except we do know. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, um, I think, um, again, all of you are really smart, parents and students included, and it's sheer years of experience. How does a parent know when a child is lying? Yeah, and it's hundreds it's, and thousands it's of resumes and years of experience. It's intuition. It's um, I, I can't even 
kind of articulate it, but even if I could, I wouldn't. Yes, and just an observation from one of the participants, uh, he or she is happy to see the book drive in your pile of books. <laughs> Thank you, well, good. I'm glad you can <laughs> see it behind me, yes. <laughs> I like it. They're more, more, you know, like, let's see what you have to say. And then let's see what you're reading in there. <laughs> yeah, let's see what my home office is. Uh, yes, exactly. And that's a map of Connecticut and Massachusetts oh. <laughs> and Rhode Island behind me because I grew up on the East Coast. But oh. anyway, so that's, what, that's what that is. Yes. I have we to have add here. I have to add. This is uh, from one of my advisees, Rishi. One curious, a uh, very, very intelligent, curious fellow. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> One last question where they're asking, should we add in our pic photograph? And the answer is no. We've told you throughout the presentation, please don't. The confusion comes because you see a lot of the modern resumes when you do a Google search that says, hey, you know, this is a modern resume. You got to put in pictures. And then we have admissions saying, please don't, you know, put in your picture. So if you're applying to an institution, we have admissions people here. Uh, and people who help you do your resume professionally for job hunting, Sunena. Uh, and they're telling you no picture. So please, no picture. Again, it comes back to what Sunena and Mandy have told you. If we're telling you that we don't want it and we're not going to look at it, please don't give it to us. That's how it goes. With um, that said, with that said, what I no notice and a lot of our, our students that are admitted into grad business, there should be a picture of you on your LinkedIn. And it should be a professional headshot. Many students do not have their pictures on LinkedIn where they should, and they attach them to resumes where they shouldn't. So please have a, a, a professional headshot of you on LinkedIn. And for the more STEM students who are applying to business school, what I notice over and over again on your LinkedIn profiles is all hard skills and no soft skills. So look at, review your LinkedIn. And we do a lot of workshops on this. So if you come to Santa Clara, you'll get well coached by me and my team on how to do a LinkedIn profile. And that's not what this is about. But the photo does, is important on LinkedIn. Include it. But do not have a weird photo. No sunglasses, no hats, no gaudy jewelry, please. Um, no, um, how can I put this delicately um, alluring uh, body language, the, the hair, the, mm, the, you know, none of that, just a nice crisp headshot. And you don't need to wear a tie gentleman in the headshot, but a collared shirt is usually the way to go. I like that. Um, student is asking, should we have a LinkedIn profile as a high school student, somebody who's applying for their freshman year? I would say yes, because increasingly I notice more and more US high school students having LinkedIn profiles. I think it's a bit um, precocious, but can't argue with trends. Um, I think you should wait until college, but it, that it's, it's really up to you. Um, but on the flip side, Serena, we have kids who are doing internships at companies and usually that's a great way to keep in contact with folks yes. that they've worked and interacted with. So I usually tell them, if you have people you've interacted with on a professional level, LinkedIn would be the way for you to keep in contact because you don't wanna send them a Facebook invite. Absolutely correct. And I think that there, you know, Anita's brought up a very good point. I think if you've done a professional company internship, that's the trigger for a LinkedIn profile. Um, yeah. Also, uh, we have seen a lot of endorsements from professionals on these kids about these kids and their skills. That's a very good thing over and about their recommendation letters, etc. So you have a very good proof on LinkedIn. So, yeah, yes, do have. And I think, and I think that that is uh, a good, you know, um, thing to do, especially if you've had a professional internship mm -hmm. or you've worked at a nonprofit. Um, and certainly, um, I think there's nothing wrong with high school students having it. Again, just be mindful. This yeah. is not Facebook. This isn't Insta. This isn't anything else except professional headshots. So no compulsion to post pictures of everything. 
Just keep it professional. Okay. Another student is asking, and this will be the last question. Um, the student's unsure if they should even have a LinkedIn profile. So as we just discussed, as if you're applying for undergraduate studies, it's kind of optional depending. But if you are applying for graduate school, Sunena, LinkedIn, yes? Yes, definitely. I see the question. Um, I'm afraid of hearing that we need a LinkedIn profile. So, you know, my question, Anish, is I, I don't think I'm, I don't think you need to be afraid of hearing that and don't feel behind if you don't have it. Maybe that's where the word, I'm interpreting the word afraid maybe a little differently than, than you're intending. You're not behind. None of you are behind. This is just a great forum for you to get information, um, jot down notes, maybe of next action steps, you have time to do this and it doesn't have to be perfect, um, but um, please, you already have enough pressure on you uh, in terms of your studies and family obligations and all the rest of it, we understand, uh, but put this on your to-do list, you know, and um, say, okay, I guess it's something I should have. So let me do a little Googling about how to do a good LinkedIn profile and then get a free account. You don't need a premium account, but get a free account and set up a profile and you can build on it. Yeah, building on it is the key and uh, keeping it um, updated. All right, I see a direct uh, message, a question from an architect. So this is the last question that we're wrapping up. Um, from an architecture program, a graduate, uh, she or he says, you know, being creative uh, you know, that would require to show my creativity. So maybe I should upload a picture. And I think, no, you should upload links to a portfolio if you're, you know, in a creative field. Uh, Mandy, Sunena, any last um, comments? For somebody in the creative field. Uh, I, I agree, portfolio. Yeah. yeah, and a link, maybe if you have your own website, a link to that, mm -hmm. but um, I, I would also keep it really simple. So if you're coming from an architectural background and applying to grad business, for example, it's good for us to, to know that this has been your, your work and this is what you've done, but it sounds like you're trying to pivot in a different direction. Um, and so uh, kind of, I would keep it simple. Yeah, simple is key. All right, so thank you, and Mandy and Sunena for joining us this evening. The importance of putting together a good resume is often overlooked, but a very crucial component in a student application. Thank you for breaking this down for us this evening and answering our entertaining questions and, you know, very serious and, you know, most asked questions as well. We had a lot of really, really good questions. I'd like to also thank my colleagues, Ramya Ashok, Shanti Mohan, and Megha Yadav. Thank you to our participants this evening, and I wish you all a good night. Um, and we look forward to seeing our participants as well as our presenters for future webinars. Yes, thank, thank you. you. This is so much thank fun. You so thank you so much. Really <laughs> thank it. you. Thank <laughs> you. Bye. 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 Have a good night. Thanks so much, everyone.